Hey, everybody. It is Thursday, November 2nd. You're listening to the Mo News Podcast. I'm Mo Shwinunu. And I'm Jill Wagner. This is the place where we bring you just the facts. And we read all the news and read between the lines so you don't have to. Uh, on this November 2nd, Jill, the internet tells me today is National Deviled Egg Day. Do you have opinions about deviled eggs? I don't, actually. <laughs> I'm totally neutral. What about you? Have you ever tried one? I have. I, I think fine. fine. I've never thought Matt. about them. You know what? I'm the yeah. same way. But <laughs> you let Jill, Jill, maybe it's time for one of your uh, surveys on deviled eggs. Because I know you just completed a survey on uh, the shower story we told everyone about yesterday. Yes. So if you missed yesterday's podcast or if you caught it, we reported on this New York Times story that said perhaps a daily shower is actually too much. Too much so for I the asked- skin. The, derm- the dermatologists think it's too much for dry skin. It creates dry skin. Correct. All right. So I asked people on Instagram, uh, you could follow me if you want, Jill R. Wagner, how often do you shower? 50% say every day, 9% say twice a day. Okay. So I I imagine those are people working out. And then 41% say less than once a day. All right. So So that means maybe five times a week or every other day. So next time you're waiting in line for coffee or in a restaurant, every other person... (laughs) based on your data, hasn't showered that day. Correct. And then I thought it was pretty interesting that you said that you used to shower in the mornings. But then when you started dating your now wife, Alex, she was like, wait, you should shower at night because you have all the dirt from the day on you before you get into bed. So I asked people when they shower. Any guesses, Mosh? I feel like we're we're a split country. Everything feels 50-50 these days. How How, how is your audience? <laughs> okay. So I was actually surprised because I thought more people were going to say that they shower in the morning. Mm. 46% say they shower in the morning. 41% say that they shower before bed, which I was surprised at. I thought that was higher than expected. Mm-hmm. And then 11% are the mid-dayers like me. Like and then I actually had a bunch of people write in and be like, I consider that midday shower to be my biggest luxury in life. Um, so Jill, <laughs> There is something luxurious about it because you're not in a rush at all. So we should note that we typically talk about scientific surveys here on the pod. This is an unscientific <laughs> yeah, is not- Instagram survey of people who follow Jill's Instagram account. Jill, uh, maybe we put this to the uh, larger group on the Mo News account and see if those numbers uh, jive. It'll be interesting because we'll see if our audiences are aligned. Yeah. Well, we don't. We know there's overlap. At least several thousand of you. Um, (laughs) Though I should know, Jill, you know, my audience is not going to be completely scientific either. It's people who follow us on Instagram. That's an overwhelmingly female, younger um, group of people. So um, we'll try to get a sense of what they say. By the way, we've noted this week on the podcast, we are taking longer with the chit chat at the top because we try to avoid the news these days. We'll get to it. (laughs) It's too depressing. Actually, Jill, should we just go there? Mosh, we can't avoid the inevitable forever. So (laughs) let's just get to it. (laughs) We're going to be starting in the Middle East for the first time since the start of the war. Hundreds of foreign nationals and critically injured people have been able to leave Gaza. Plus, is there a plan for a post-Hamas Gaza? And in overseas news, Pakistan is forcing more than a million Afghans out of the country, many of whom fled when the Taliban took over back in 2021. To U.S. politics, Donald Trump Jr. takes the witness stand in the New York fraud suit against his father. In health news, the American Cancer Society has expanded its lung cancer screening guidelines for cigarette smokers. We'll tell you how. Plus, teachers go on strike in Portland, Oregon. It's the latest big union move in 2023. And the Pentagon launches a UFO reporting form. They're trying to eliminate the stigma folks. They want you to report UFOs if you see it, because they actually need to figure out if there are aliens out there. And Starbucks holiday menu is here. Peppermint Mocha back for its 21st year. But one popular item is notably missing from the menu. Ooh, quite a tease. You're gonna have to wait a couple minutes (laughs) for that one, folks. And if you're interested in what took place in that TV news scandal last year, remember those uh, ex-GMA3 anchors? Well, they now have a podcast. Who doesn't, Jill? Who doesn't? (laughs) And most will have on this day in history. Your clue today, there's an old man sitting next to me making love to his tonic and gin. Mosh, you are clearly speaking my language (laughs) as a native Long Islander, so I'm looking forward to that. (laughs) All 
All right, let's start in the Middle East. For the first time since the start of the war, hundreds of foreign nationals, including a handful of Americans, have started to arrive in Egypt from Gaza through the Rafah border crossing. Ambulances from Egypt also entered the Rafah crossing to evacuate critically injured people from the area. The U.S. and Israel have said that up until now, Hamas was preventing foreign nationals from leaving the region. Qatar, which houses Hamas leaders and reportedly helps to fund the organization, helped to broker the deal, Moshe adding just to the absolute complex nature of what's happening overseas right now. Yeah, you know, we've been talking a lot about that border and the aid coming in, which is a negotiation between the Egyptians and the Israelis because the Israelis want to inspect what's going into Gaza. Then you have the issue of the people coming out of Gaza, which is a holdup up on the Hamas side uh, because they have to open the gates. Uh, and then the complexity is, depending on who opens up the gates, the Israelis might want to take out some of those Hamas officials. So this this border issue that we've been dealing with for three and a half weeks, the U.S., I mean, literally there's um, five to seven entities doing this negotiation uh, right now. Right. So the Gaza border crossing authority, it's actually run by the Hamas government in Gaza. And they published a list of people that they said were approved to exit. And that includes nearly 500 foreigners. Most of them are citizens of eight countries or are associated with NGOs. It is possible that more people will be added. And President Biden said that some U.S. citizens will be departing Gaza as well. Yeah, he's hoping uh, to get uh, all out who want to get out. That's several hundred Americans right now. As of late Wednesday, just five Americans were let out of Gaza, uh, eight workers uh, associated with NGO. Uh, in fact, Jill, someone in the Mo News community says they know one of the people who got let out. So I'm following up with them right now to see if we can speak with them when they might want to speak. So those precarious negotiations continue on the border there. Um, there's reluctance on the part of the Egyptians to take in refugees, but they are letting in people who won't stay in the country um, and letting in uh, some folks who um, need uh, extra medical care. There's a whole facility set up in Egypt, but they're being very careful about how many people they're letting into the Sinai Peninsula right now. As far as now, we're in this war. It will likely take weeks, if not months more before it's over. But there's a lot of talk right now as to what comes next for Gaza after this war is over. Right now, Politico is reporting that talks are underway to establish a multinational force in Gaza after, assuming, Israel is able to uproot Hamas. Two U.S. Senators, Chris Van Hollen of Maryland and Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, say that there is early closed-door diplomacy right now over establishing a peacekeeping force in Gaza. Uh, right now, they don't believe that'll include American troops. The talks are very preliminary and fragile. Keep in mind, Hamas has run Gaza for more than 15 years now. So extracting them is going to be very complicated, and as we've been telling you, potentially deadly uh, for both sides, for the Palestinian civilians, um, as well as the Israeli side. So the talk is what comes next? Who takes over the Gaza Strip? Two and a half million people, uh, an area about the size of the city of Philadelphia. And so there's talk right now of the Saudi Arabians being involved uh, in a force to provide resources and longer term support Palestinian leadership and a separate state. That's something the Saudis were actually talking about with the Israelis before the war started, uh, before the war basically ended those peace talks. Con reconstruction here in Gaza uh, is going to likely require a vast amount of resources in the billions of dollars. Um, while the Saudis have deep pockets among some other countries in the region, so they're hoping they'll get involved here. Um, the Europeans likely will also be involved. Notably, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, we put this up on the Instagram earlier this week, told lawmakers this week that the preference is for the Palestinian Authority to take over the Gaza Strip. That is the former PLO, a government entity that functions as the government, as the international representation for the Palestinian people and runs the West Bank. They did initially run the Gaza Strip. That was until 2007, when uh, Hamas basically pulled a military coup, uh, murdered several hundred members of the Palestinian Authority and kicked them out for the past 16 years. So the hope is to bring them back. The problem is they don't have credibility with the Palestinian people either. They're viewed as widely inept, completely corrupt, run by nearly 88-year-old Mahmoud Abbas, who refuses to have elections. Why? Because he's scared Hamas is going to win. So uh, the question is, do you need some new Palestinian entity uh, put together by these Arab governments? So this will be complicated. Well, it is complicated right now. The future is complicated. And they are trying to figure out what to do with the Gaza Strip, how to ensure there's a new reality on the ground uh, after this war ends. Hence why the U.S., Israel, and a few others are against a ceasefire right now. Yeah, Israel says that they would consider a humanitarian pause of a few hours, but they say a ceasefire would just give Hamas more time to plan new attacks. 
just for definition's sake, when we talk about humanitarian pause, we're talking about a few hours, whereas a ceasefire is, you know, ceasefire, like we're completely done with um, any sort of military action. And Mosh, hence the dilemma you posted on the Instagram account, an interview from just a week ago where a leader from Hamas was being interviewed in Lebanon. And he said that uh, Hamas would do as many October 7th attacks as necessary to destroy Israel and sacrifice as many Palestinians as it took. Yeah, I mean, that's the Hamas line here. That's the complicating factor. I mean, that's why some people are saying save Palestinians or free Palestine from Hamas. Um, they don't care about the people there. Uh, There's also a clip recently of a Hamas official saying, we built the tunnels to protect ourselves. The UN and Israel are in charge of protecting people above ground. Um, so that's the dilemma here is extracting a terrorist group that runs an area of land uh, but doing it in a way that doesn't continue to harm and kill civilians, which is challenging um, given the environment here, given how embedded they are. Um, and so, you know, it's one of the reasons I think when you hear that, that's what the Israelis see and why Israelis don't want to cease fire. They're like, look at who we're dealing with here. That's the Israeli perspective. They literally are saying, we're going to do more of those October 7th terrorist attacks until you're completely destroyed. So from the Israeli perspective, it was Hamas that broke the ceasefire on October 7th. At the same time, a lot of humanitarian groups, a lot of countries around the world, um, a lot of folks around the Middle East um, are saying, well, you know, we might not like Hamas, but we don't believe that what Israel is doing right now is the right approach and is killing a lot of innocent people in the process. When asked for an alternative, they aren't really able to give Israel much of a realistic alternative on how to eliminate Hamas. So they bring up uh, assassinations or, you know, snipers, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you know, you're talking of Hamas, you're talking about 30 to 40,000 um, strong group that manages that piece of territory. Uh, so hence the dilemma we're talking about here uh, and the unfortunate situation that the civilian death toll will likely rise here uh, in the coming weeks and months. Right. It comes as this new analysis by two American researchers at Oregon State University and CUNY and a college in New York has found that tens of thousands of buildings in Gaza, including at least a quarter of all buildings in northern Gaza, appear damaged or destroyed. That's according to an analysis of satellite imagery. Israeli strikes in Gaza have killed more than 8,000 people, according to Hamas officials, between about 38,000 and 44,000 buildings throughout the Gaza Strip are estimated to have been damaged or destroyed since the beginning of the war, according to that analysis, showing the challenge uh, for all of the civilians that are there right now. And as we were just talking about, for what comes next and, and what's just going to be this massive effort to rebuild this area. Yeah, the billions of dollars it's probably going to take to rebuild the Gaza Strip here. It comes, by the way, Jill, we should note uh, one other item that another Iran-backed uh, terror group has joined the fighting. They are the Houthis of Yemen. Uh, they are a rebel movement that controls um, wide swaths of Yemen, including the capital of Sana'a. It's more than a thousand miles away from the current fighting, but they announced this week that they have joined the fighting. They are also trying to destroy Israel. They've launched a number of drone and missile attacks um, and they have some longer range missiles. So far, all those missiles have been shot down or fallen short of their target. Um, but it does give you a sense of Iranian foreign policy here using their various rebel groups that they fund and weaponize. The Houthis, by the way, uh, have a motto, Jill. Their motto is, God is great, death to America, death to Israel, curse the Jews, we will win. So uh, that's, I think they've covered all their bases. It's a long motto. It's a long motto. So, Mosh, now Israel is clearly fighting a multi-front war between Hamas and Gaza. Uh, there's some fighting in the West Bank. You've got Hezbollah in the north in Lebanon launching some attacks as well. And as you just mentioned, the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Why have we not seen, I know this is one of the big concerns on, from Israel's part, because Hezbollah is like Hamas times 100. They're that they're more highly trained soldiers. Uh, they have better arms. Why have they not fully, fully engaged? They're firing rockets, but it hasn't been like a full battle yet. What What are they waiting? For? Well, they have their own dilemma. But one of their dilemmas is that they are located in Lebanon, a country that has no interest in the war. And so Hezbollah is a political movement inside Lebanon. Uh, they control a wide swath of territory there. Uh, and a lot of Lebanese people we're not so pleased with them the last time they went to war with Israel in 2006, that then leads Israel to respond by bombing um, his blood positions across Lebanon. Now, Lebanon has a very dysfunctional economy right now. Inflation is close to 100%. Uh, they're still recovering from that massive explosion in Beirut in the last couple of years. You might remember that one. Um, some people, by the way, 
assuming that those were Hezbollah weapons that exploded by accident there in central Beirut. Oh, interesting. And so um, ultimately, while the Iranians are like, get involved, and they're certainly shooting missiles, they've killed a couple of Israelis, uh, there have been skirmishes back and forth. Their issue is domestic in Lebanon. Um, and uh, the Lebanese have zero appetite um, to get involved here. They are like, we have so many problems at home. Please do not drag us into this Hezbollah. And so Hezbollah is like trying to figure out what to do. By the way, the Israelis are not playing when they um, are taking some of the assault from the north. They are firing back. They've taken out a number of Hezbollah positions. And so, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Notably, Hezbollah, Hamas, Iran, all meeting pretty frequently in Beirut to discuss next steps. But I think there's this like trepidation. You know, Iran is talking a big game. These groups are talking a big game. But they understand that, you know, you actually get involved in war, there are huge ramifications here. And it appears, you know, what many analysts see is that if Hezbollah in three and a half weeks hasn't gotten involved yet, this is the extent of, of what they're going to do. Um, and uh, but 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 we will see if that bears out. All right. Switching gears now to an update on the Trump family's civil trial over business fraud in New York state. This trial is about whether Donald Trump overstated his wealth to banks and insurers as a way to get better loan terms and manipulate taxes for the Trump organization. Donald Trump Jr. took the stand Wednesday, the first family member to testify. He seemed to be in a relatively good mood, joking to photographers who took his photo I should have worn makeup. That's my line, Mosh. New York State prosecutors asked him a series of questions about his education and career at the family business, the Trump Organization. Reporters inside the court say that he made some lighthearted asides. For example, he was asked whether he belonged to an accountant's organization, and he replied, Sounds very exciting, but no. Don Jr. is the executive vice president of the Trump organization, and he did make a serious effort to show that he is not an expert when it comes to accounting standards that are mentioned in the case. By the way, I was just checking his Twitter feed to see if he commented on the trial. He's mainly just been focused on mocking Ron DeSantis on his feed, Jill, and the fact that Ron DeSantis allegedly wears lifts in his shoes to be taller. So that's been Don Trump Jr.'s um, Twitter feed, if anyone's curious. Back to his testimony, though, in court, uh, he said, I rely on professionals and CPAs on certain matters. And this is something the family is saying is that depending on the advice of accountants, he said he couldn't recall having to use standardized accounting practices in his work. He got a laugh out of a state lawyer when he said he'd learned about them probably in Accounting 101 back in Wharton, but didn't remember much other about various accounting practices. Keep in mind, he's just one of the family members who's going to have to testify here. Eric Trump, his brother, as well as Ivanka, are also slated to testify. Uh, Donald Trump, former President Trump, himself could take the stand early next week. So be on the lookout for that. The Trumps, of course, have denied any wrongdoing here, uh, that they're fighting to keep the business intact, that this is just a political scam by a Democratic DA. For her part, New York Democratic Attorney General Letitia James says Trump, his company and top executives, conspired to exaggerate his wealth by billions of dollars on financial statements to secure loans and make other deals. She is seeking $250 million in fines, a permanent ban against Trump, and Eric and Don Jr. from running businesses in New York and a five-year commercial real estate ban against Trump and the Trump Organization in the state of New York. Remember, this is just one of the civil trials. Former President Trump is also facing four criminal trials, the Georgia case, the uh, New York case regarding uh, money to Stormy Daniels, the federal case regarding Mar-a-Lago, as well as the federal case regarding January 6th. So he's got a lot of other stuff on the docket uh, for 2024. But this trial so far, uh, you know, there have been a couple decisions against the Trumps, including the judge before the trial ruling that Trump's financial statements were, in fact, fraudulent. And the judge ordered a court appointed receiver to seize control of some of his companies. All right. Time for the speed read. Let's start overseas with a story not getting enough attention. This from NPR. In a new expulsion campaign, Pakistan is forcing more than one million Afghans out of the country and likely back to Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. Large numbers of Afghans crammed into trucks and buses in Pakistan on Tuesday, heading to the border to return home ahead of the expiration of a Pakistani government deadline for those who are in the country illegally to leave or face deportation. This deadline is part of a new anti-migrant crackdown that targets all undocumented or unregistered foreigners. This is according to uh, Islamabad. But it mostly affects Afghans who make up the bulk of migrants that are in Pakistan. The expulsion campaign has drawn widespread criticism from UN agencies, rights groups, 
And even the Taliban-led administration in Afghanistan, Pakistani officials have warned that people who are in the country illegally face arrest and deportation. UN agencies say that there are more than 2 million undocumented Afghans in Pakistan, at least 600,000 of whom fled after the Taliban takeover in 2021. Yeah, although the Pakistani government says it's not targeting Afghans here, the campaign does come amid some strained relations between Pakistan and the Taliban next door. Uh, they've had issues for a very long time, including uh, the, there's a Taliban offshoot in Pakistan uh, that uh, the Pakistani government has to deal with. That said, they want these Afghan migrants out. More than 200,000 have already had to return home since the crackdown was launched in recent weeks. This crackdown has worried thousands of Afghans in Pakistan waiting for relocation to the U.S. under a special refugee program since fleeing the Taliban takeover. So they fled Afghanistan. They've been waiting in Pakistan, waiting to get into the U.S. But under U.S. rules, applicants first had to relocate to that third country, to Pakistan, before their cases could be processed. The issue you face now is they're going to be forced back into Afghanistan. Jill, we're more than two years out now from the Taliban takeover, still dealing with this severe humanitarian crisis. And that continues, by the way, in Afghanistan, particularly for women and girls who are banned by the Taliban from getting an education beyond sixth grade, most public spaces and jobs. There are also restrictions, of course, on women in the media, activists, civil society. So a very concerning development we'll keep tabs on here. From Stat News, the American Cancer Society is expanding its lung cancer screening guidelines for cigarette smokers. Most lung cancer screening guidelines hinge on how much people smoked tobacco and when they last smoked. But the American Cancer Society now saying that it doesn't matter how long ago they quit. On Wednesday, the group released guidance recommendations that anyone with a significant smoking history get an annual low-dose CT scan for lung cancer. The new guidelines also expand the age range for lung cancer screening to 50 through 80 instead of 55 through 74 and lower the smoking history requirement from 30 cigarette pack years to 20 pack years or more. So that means the equivalent of a pack a day for 20 years, which includes two packs a day for 10 years, or four packs a day for five years. These recommendations bring the new age range and smoking history requirements in line with that of the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force's Lung Cancer Guidelines. Yikes, that is a mouthful, Mosh. Uh, they were updated in 2021. However, the task force still only extends lung cancer screening eligibility to patients who quit smoking within the last 15 years. So expanding the guidelines might help people discover more early stage lung tumors. And that's when treatment has a much higher likelihood of success. Jill was just looking up the numbers on how many Americans still smoke cigarettes. Uh, and as of 20 years ago, 20% of Americans said they smoke cigarettes. Uh, today, it's about 10%. So one in 10 Americans. Of course, vaping has gotten uh, very popular in recent years as well. One of the main reasons, though, that the American Cancer Society want to strike the years since requirement uh, from their guidelines was that many former smokers are still at high risk for lung cancer, regardless of when they quit smoking. They said the more that we dug into the data, the more we saw that there was no real evidence for that years since criteria. Um, it turns out that as you get older, the risk of all cancers, including lung, accumulates with age, um, hence why they want to, people to keep tabs on this. And so any former smoker's risk of lung cancer will still be higher than the average never smoker, and it doesn't go away after 15 years. From the Associated Press, teachers in Portland, Oregon, walked off the job on Wednesday for the first day of a strike that shuttered schools for about 45,000 students in Oregon's largest city. The Portland Association of Teachers, which represents about 3,700 teachers, school counselors and other employees in the negotiations, is asking for higher pay, more time to plan lessons and a cap on class sizes, among other issues. They say that students' emotional and academic needs have skyrocketed since the pandemic and that employees are under strain and under supported. Teachers describe crowded classrooms where there aren't enough desks. Teachers who are working up to 20 hours a week unpaid to keep up with their workloads and schools that are overwhelmed by students' mental health challenges. The average salary for a Portland teacher is $87,000 a year, according to Portland Public Schools, which is slightly above the area median income for a single person and below the median for a family of four. So they've been negotiating with the district for a number of months since their contract expired and said, you know, we've had it, we got to walk off the job here. 
Right now, Portland Public Schools has offered raises of 4.5% for the first year, 3% for subsequent years of the new contract. The union is asking for 8.5% in the first year to keep up with the cost of living and inflation, as well as 6 and 5% in subsequent years. So about double what they're currently being offered. The district says, though, they cannot afford the union's proposal, saying they are basically uh, have a difference here of $200 million between what they can pay teachers and what teachers are demanding. Officials in the school say that funding from the state legislature has not kept up with inflation and a state law limits the district's ability to raise taxes on residents, putting them in a tough spot here. Um, Jill, it does come as we've been talking about a lot of strikes this year um, between um, airlines, the auto workers, um, Hollywood. Um, It's a big year for strikes here as uh, workers feel emboldened that they need to be demanding a better pay as inflation has gotten so high in the past couple of years. From NBC News, think you have evidence of a secret government UFO program? Well, now there's a form for that. The Department of Defense has launched a new online tool to report government activity related to unidentified anomalous phenomena, also known as UFOs or UAPs. Yeah, they're trying to make UAPs happen there, unidentified anomalous phenomena. But I like UFO, Joe. Stop trying to make fetch happen. (laughs) Now, in addition to housing photos and videos of potential cases, the website offers those claiming firsthand knowledge of a U.S. government program or activity related to UAP to submit that information to the government. So basically, Mosh, they're asking for whistleblowers here. This isn't about necessarily the public having seen a UFO and reporting it. The government is asking government employees to report secret government programs about aliens. You got it? While the form's use is limited to current or former U.S. government employees, service members, and contractors, the office's director, Sean Kirkpatrick, said he understands that the public would like to report sightings to his office. He said we are exploring methods for how the public can do so in the forthcoming third phase of the secure reporting mechanism, blah, blah, blah. I I feel for the person who eventually when they have that form has to go through all of the public comments about, hey, I think I saw something here. I think I saw something there. That said, we should say candidly, one of the issues the government has said in figuring out if these, you know, what the deal is with UFOs or UAPs, which is the larger all encompassing, you know, if they're not flying, but they're underwater, UAPs covers it, is there's stigma. You know, you're mocked if you say I saw a UFO or I was abducted by an alien. And they would like that to no longer be stigmatized. They want you to say, if you saw it, report it. We need to investigate everything. They've established this new office, the AARO, ARO, All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. ARO was established by the Biden administration last year. They've been tasked with reviewing UAP reports going back decades, and they will turn in a report next June. We'll cover it here on the Mo News Podcast. They're actually going back to all reports going back to 1945. This is congressionally mandated with all the hubbub that we've heard about UFOs and UAPs lately. Um, And so uh, here we go. We'll see what other government employees might have to say. You might remember the testimony a couple months ago from somebody who said they heard from somebody else inside that they totally had found aliens, but they hadn't seen it themselves. And so they're trying to get to the bottom of that. And so I think it's one of the more interesting jobs if, if you're in the government right now, Jill trying to figure out the UFO thing. As we've said here on the podcast, any UFO or alien who comes to Earth to see if we are a threat is definitely looking at the situation and saying, (laughs) not a threat, they're killing each other, don't worry about it. Yeah. No, no, this TikTok thing seems like it's going to totally destroy them. So uh, <laughs> let them just keep on TikTok. We're going to go back to our our. Uh, yeah, it's system. self-sabotage. In lighter news from food and wine, one thing is certain, no matter how unseasonably warm November turns out to be, or cold, by the way, it's, it's actually, there's a huge cold front uh, in much of the country. Starbucks will ring in the holiday season with new sips. The coffee chain plans to drop its winter menu at cafes across the United States today. And one holiday favorite did not make the cut. Mosh, you can give them the bad news, but I will start with what's actually on the menu. The brand new iced gingerbread oat milk chai is the holiday menu's spotlight. Mm. It includes a warm blend of ginger, cinnamon, and black tea, reminiscent of another seasonal item launched earlier this year. Jill, are you into the ginger cinnamon combo? I don't mind a little ginger cinnamon. Okay. All right. Let me know how it is. The beloved peppermint mocha set to appear on holiday menus for the 21st consecutive year. And it arrives alongside the caramel brulee latte, the chestnut praline latte and iced sugar cookie almond milk latte, which I think 
sounds like the winner there. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds like just basically sugar inside coffee. I don't know how much coffee is left with all those other flavors. And if you happen to live near one of those Oleato locations, you will be able to get uh, your holiday fix with a side of extra virgin olive oil. Remember that? The coffee that has the olive oil? Yeah. Really, Starbucks is trying to take it up a notch. Um, so that's what's on the menu. Jill has left me with what's not on the menu here. Absent this year is the toasted white chocolate mocha. Sorry for those of you who might have liked that drink. It's been on the menu for about five years now, um, and they've decided to take it off. But rest assured, there's more that's on the menu, they tell us. Five bakery items will also be offered this season. A cranberry bliss bar, a gingerbread loaf, peppermint brownie cake pop, mm. snowman cookie, and a sugar plum cheese danish. Jill, I've never really been into the Starbucks pastries, but, uh, you know, some of those sound pretty good. The winter menu also accompanies the launch of Starbucks's grocery lineup. So you can see it at your local grocery store. Uh, they have a bunch of coffees and creamers with flavors like peppermint mocha, of course, gingerbread, and cinnamon and, and cinnamon dulce. Uh, this uh, story not brought to you by Starbucks, though if you work with Starbucks or an agency representing Starbucks, we're happy to take you on as a sponsor here on the <laughs> And from NBC News, former GMA3 anchors TJ Holmes and Amy Robach, who were booted from ABC News after news of their affair surfaced, they announced Wednesday that they are launching a podcast together. The couple shared a photo on Instagram with the caption, how's this for Instagram official with the hashtag silent no more. Their iHeart Media podcast, Amy and TJ, premieres on December 5th, and it will explore, quote, meaningful conversations about current events, pop culture, and everything in between. Nothing is apparently off limits, they say. Quite a tease. So GMA3, Good Morning America 3, was this afternoon show that many people actually didn't know about until this affair came about. Um, they would both lose their job. They were both married to other people at the time are divorced now. This will be the first time they're speaking at length about um, what took place here. A lot has happened since December 2022 when the news first surfaced of their relationship. Uh, this was one of those, you know, mini media scandals that a lot of people were talking about um, at the time. And people were surprised that they both lost their jobs over it. Uh, and here we are, Jill. Um, when all else fails, you start your podcast. <laughs> it's a bit it appears to be like the default career for people who've just been booed. Maybe, I don't know what that says about us, but uh, it's quite the, the well, I popular will say this. thing. I will say this. There are several million podcasts out there, but there's only a couple hundred thousand that actually do more than one episode. And then there's you know, tens of thousands that actually um, will continue to update. So I give us a lot of credit in a world of many podcasts. Many people will start a podcast. How long it goes and you know how much time they devote to it is another story. But to that, we thank you, the listener, for uh, keeping us going here on the Mo News Pod. Now nearly 18 months old. And definitely for me, Mosh, one of the highlights of my career. All right, now time for On This Day in History. Jill, we're going to have to see if we can make it as long as the BBC. <laughs> on this day in 1936, the British Broadcasting Corporation officially launches a television channel, the world's first regular TV service. Beep. <laughs> beep, beep. from the bbc in london jill we're about 85 years behind the bbc with the mo news pod okay all right well goals podcasting goals 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 everybody <laughs> all right fast forward to 1983 on this day ronald reagan president reagan signed a bill creating martin luther king jr day we told you about this earlier this year but part of the lobbying effort to create mlk day uh, was actually Stevie Wonder's happy birthday song. Happy birthday to you. If you actually listen to the lyrics, it's all about Martin Luther King. And that song was part of the advocacy effort to create a national holiday for the civil rights leader. All right, on this day in 1988, we're staying in the 80s here, a computer science student at Cornell released the first computer worm. It was designed to secretly copy itself onto other computers and the internet. This is the very early internet at the time. It was meant as an experiment. It actually brought 6,000 computers down Back then, Jill, 6,000 computers was 10% of the internet. And on this day in 2004, a community activist, just 43 years old, you might know his name, Barack Obama, was elected to the U.S. Senate from Illinois. Uh, just less than five years later, he would become president. Okay, we end here with a couple of musical classics turning 50 years old today. Sing us a song, you're the piano man. Sing us a song tonight. Wait, Mosh, are you absolutely sure that, that that's correct? It, it, turning 50? I don't think I've ever <laughs> felt older. Jill, we double checked. It was released by a 24-year-old Billy Joel at the time. 
Billy Joel, by the way, born in 1949, he was uh, playing lounge acts in LA, wrote this song uh, about his experience playing the piano. Uh, piano Man, we should note, when it was released 50 years ago today, um, wasn't a massive hit. The single actually only reached to number 25 on the Billboard charts. The album topped out at number 27. But of course, you wouldn't know that today. I mean, it is a classic. You cannot go to a single bar that has a piano <laughs> uh, without somebody playing it. Um, it is uh, quite the classic. In fact, Billy Joel, you know, for all of his famous songs, became known as the Piano Man. Yes, the urban legend was that it was kind of like a filler song in one of his albums. And he was shocked that it became as popular as it did eventually. Great tune. Great tune. All right. One other classic song celebrates a birthday on this day. I was born in a small town. John Mellencamp released his song Small Town 38 years ago today, November 2nd, 1985. Still feeling old, chill. So this is where if you would have asked me which song was older... Piano Man mm. or Small Town. I may actually have said Small Town. I don't know why. For some reason, I just did not think that Piano Man was that old. Jill Mellencamp and Joel, about two years apart. Uh, Billy Joel, 74. Mellencamp, 72. So not hard to believe there, but the songs themselves, 12 years apart. All right, Mosh. This on this day, uh, mind blown. We want to thank everyone for listening to the Mo News Podcast. If you like what you hear, share this with your friends. It will help us grow. Follow us and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And review us in the App Store. We're here to blow your mind on a daily basis <laughs> with the factoids, with the knowledge. We want you to take it to your friends, to your dinner with your family, and then just drop some knowledge on them. And, and they might ask you, how do you know that? And you'll say to them, it's the Mo News Podcast. You need to listen to it. Does that sound right to you? <laughs> I'm here for it. All right. Bye, everybody. Later.